Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, the Quiet Warrior. All right, all right, everybody. Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta. I am your host today. And before I introduce our guests, I just want to say that we are live streaming. It's the next generation of broadcasting. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter this morning. If you have that feed, you can comment in the chat box. We can interact live on the show. This will be released in the future as the Quiet Warrior Show podcast and also a video premiere on YouTube, which will be very special. Uh, let me tell you a couple of things before I introduce you to Sarah Jane Gary. She's on the screen there. And, you know, I, I fell in love with this story. I, I learned of this, uh, this author. And I said to her this, I said, hey, before you come on my show, I said, I'd like to know what your real story is behind the story. And uh, she wrote me back this. I'm just going to read it, Sarah Jane. It says, uh, I'm a good fit for the Quiet Warrior Show because... My story is more than just a memoir of my late husband, Bernie's hero's journey, and we're going to honor Bernie today, but it's also my story and the journey of our 52 years of marriage. I've learned how my grief has turned to joy in writing, how my pilot and I sacrificed for the sake of marriage instead of each other, and lastly, and how my gratitude grows and sustains me each day as I go forward. And for all of you out there, you know, it's the unsung heroes that are behind the heroes that really are uh, the stories we want to hear. So uh, welcome to the show, Sarah Jane. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be with you. <laughs> yeah. I am, um, you know, I, I we're just going to be storytelling today. And uh, I have read your book. I, we're going to surprise you with a review. And I'm going to actually talk about the book earlier in the episode so that we can use that as a basis for the story. Uh, but I wanted to timestamp this. You know, we're April 27th, 2022. Uh, it's, it's remarkable the world we're in because we're literally, some are saying, in World War III or on the verge of that because of what's happening in Europe. And here we are. It's remarkable talking to you, a published author of a book about your relationship with a war hero. And the last thing I want to say to you is that going, uh, my wife and I are, we, we do enjoy our faith. So we watch faith uh, on Sunday. We watch church together online and we've been married 26 years. And I was watching a classic episode of Billy Graham's and I just had this thought because my brain's three dimensional. It goes in different directions. He was, he was speaking and it was a 2001 uh, uh, sermon. And he said, the world is in a mess. He said, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, there's all the oil and money. And then there's countries that are fighting and at, at war, always wars. And I had this flashback, Sarah Jane, in my mind. I went, that it's 20 years later. And today we're still talking about the world in that way. And what reminded me of when I read this book and all is that all the sacrifices and all the incredible things behind the men and women who go through these periods of time. And that's what makes this very special. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you and just tell us tell us where you are now and anything you'd like to start us off. I'd like to hear about why you wrote the book. Maybe you can hold it up for us. Oh, okay. Do you want me to hold it up now? Yeah, sure. And just, just read out the title. Uh, it's called My Pilot, A Story of, whoops. That's okay. Of War, yeah. Love, and ALS. All right. What a beautiful book cover. And by the way, I'm going to brag because I have my very own copy here. <laughs> oh, good. Good, yeah. uh, I'm going to brag for you, but on the, on the front, if you noticed everybody, there were three stickers. This book has won awards, the independent press award, the military writers, so society of America silver medal award and the New York city, big book award. So although my show is not a pitch on books, this is all about the story. So why did you write this book? I wrote the book because I wanted to make a tribute to my husband. Uh, I had written a tribute to my mother's family in 2012, and he died in 2013. And I told him I wanted to write the Geary story, and I wanted to hear it right from him. Oh, as I typed it in on my laptop while he was eating, he had ALS at the time. The last few years of his life, he developed that. So uh, 
And when I moved, after he passed away, I moved to New Jersey and I was unpacking and I found all those old Vietnam letters from 65 and 66, even Okinawa the year before. And I was still in grief looking for my writing group here in New Jersey and his personality came through the letters and I was, oh, I, I was just so touched by that. Uh, yeah. The humanity that he, uh, 26 years old, and he was writing his heart out to me. It was absolutely wonderful. And I thought, what a wonderful way to uh, bless my grandchildren and great-grandchildren uh, to pass this legacy on and tell them what he was like, what he went through. And then it morphed into what we went through together and the whole marriage for 52 years, ups and downs, there were plenty of them. But uh, I'm sure, I'm, I am sure. I mean, I'm at 26 years and I can definitely relate to, oh. I want to put something up here to bring some life to, so your husband, your late husband, and we're very sorry for the loss of him. Today. I wrote, uh, I'm going to surprise you in a moment with a book review I've written for you, that it was an unexpected twist in the story, which was a, 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 a great part of the story. You read these this book and everybody, it's called My Pilot, A Story of War, Love, and ALS, as, as you know. And I think about, oh boy, there's going to be a, a, a chapter where he's going to go down in flames and that that's the tragedy. Uh, we'll hear more as we go through the story, but it, it was a different twist and it was a tragic twist, but it was really one of courage from you, Sarah Jane, uh, how, you, how you stayed uh, through that. I want to show a picture here to get us back at the beginning. Uh, there you are, the two of you. Uh, I dug this up doing my research. What a beautiful picture. Now, you both were married in in 61, right? 1961? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I got to tell you that uh, I'm a few years younger. I was born in 1964. And so this particular uh, journey for me had an unintended consequence. So before we get back into you, the story, I want to surprise you with something here. Everybody, I wrote this book and I want to encourage you. Again, I'm holding it up and Sarah Jane kindly sent it and signed it, that an author's work only is known if we read their books and post reviews. So I'd like you to get the book. I highly recommend it to post a review on Amazon or also goodreads.com where uh, people go and look at the book. It just creates more awareness. Uh, but here is my review. So are you ready for it? I'm Thanks ready. So <laughs> All right. Uh, and I'm going to read it out loud best I can. All right. What an awesome review. So uh, I wrote here, author Sarah Jane's Gears book is a masterful collection of the unintended impact or, of storytelling. There's something covering it up there. The unintended impact for me was reliving my life through uh, this story of a war hero and his wonderful spouse. I was born on a military base with a military commanding officer father, and his career turned into alcoholism, tragedy, and divorce. As I read... I love the collection of letters between Bernie and Sarah Jane and seeing a marriage grow despite the distant and challenging dynamics of a military man stole my heart. It was a story my parents could never tell. The other heroine in the story is the author. As you read, you will see courage uh, and pain of a woman trapped in circumstances beyond her control, yet they both found love in one another. The story that ended Bernie's life is unexpected twist that brings the reality of life to the pages. The sacrifice of Sarah Jane is undeniable and heartwarming. I highly recommend this book, uh, Tom Dutta. So congratulations. Uh, and I'm just going to celebrate. If Bernie was watching and I know he is, we're going to just do some fireworks for Bernie. Oh, and for you. How wonderful. <laughs> All right. So, so let's go back. I want to just talk in, in some chapters of your life. So going back, you married in 61. And then just tell us a bit about the story from there, your high school sweetheart, and then things changed? Um, actually, he was a college sweetheart. He came from Chicago and I yeah. came from St. Louis. We met in Iowa at Coke College, Cedar Rapids. Um, I, I believe it was love at first sight. It was actually a blind date, but we knew who we were. We weren't blind about each other. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we went out and from then, then on, uh, I wanted to get married and so did he, but the circumstances were such we had no money. He had a year to go to finish. And so I completed two years of college and went home, lived with my parents, got a job at the phone company and saved, I think I think I saved $750 that year. So we could afford to get married and let him finish out his last semester at school and go into the Air Force through ROTC. So that, that led me to 
being an Air Force wife. And after that, um, we moved to Texas where he went to pilot training. And from then on, I was an Air Force wife for the next uh, five years. Well, wow. Vietnam, through Okinawa, Vietnam, he was, then when he came back, he was an instructor. He had uh, one year left for Uncle Sam. And it's yeah. interesting because when he was young at, and college student, they taught him how to fly in Iowa uh, for ROTC. So he learned to fly there before he went into the Air Force. And then there he learned jet training. So and well, that's amazing. An adventure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and again, I want to reflect back on the book, everybody. We're talking to the author of the book, My Pilot. Uh, I love to read, as you know, and I love to pull out of the books on my show. So um, on page 13, that's the early stage, you wrote, Bernie and I married in 61 when my pilot had one semester left, as you said. But it's this next line that got me. I worked at the telephone company and rode the bus home when it was 30 below zero. Unbelievable. You know, everybody, if, if you live in Western Canada, I'm on the West Coast, it's the warm currents from California here, but you know, there's parts of our country back East, you know, parallel to, or maybe up and down to New York where you have these temperatures. And this is why this book is uh, about two heroes. I mean, doing that to help him finish his term and get into uh, his passion of, uh, of, of flying is just something else. I like to just go to uh, the, the next part, um, or the next question I had was about being a military wife. You're taking me back to a, an era where my parents, where I was born in 1964, as I said, and there's many things in the book, everybody, that uh, were nuggets. For example, I was born on a military base and my mom always told me, my mom's still alive, but she says, you know, your father couldn't come down to the birthing. I was born premature in, in the back of a cab, pretty halfway. And I never really understood that. And I, I was angry with my dad, for even up until I read your book, I was kind of angry about it. I thought you didn't even want to make the effort, but I read your book. And when Lisa, I think it's Lisa, right? My, or, my daughter mm -hmm. was born. Tell us about that because you said they weren't, he, he, Barry wasn't, Bernie wasn't allowed to be in the, in, in the, in the room or something like that. I just seem to remember reading that. Well, there was no room at the base. We moved there and I was uh, seven months pregnant. I see. So there was no room at the base. MacDill in Florida was full. Yeah. Board. So we had it at, at St. Joseph's, a private. Uh, I see. In Tampa. And yeah. in those days, the uh, father was not allowed in the delivery room. Yeah. So I didn't so. understand that. No. Yeah. He, he spent all night walking around trying his pipe out, which was <laughs> the thing to do. It made him sick, I think. Um, and then they, they finally said, please go home. Go yeah. home. So, yeah. and he went home and then the call came and he came back and Lisa was born, but it was pretty lonely for me too. To go <laughs> to myself. All these well, horses, I didn't know who they were. So, well, but, congratulations. I was that a, uh, sorry, I'm still trying to clarify. Was that a military rule or was that just in those days? It's a, it, was, it was a regular rule. This was a Catholic hospital. Yeah. Uh, I suppose it was all hospitals in those days. Yeah. I have three friends that are nurses and I just don't yeah. think the thing unless the father was a doctor himself or knew somebody you know in the hospital yeah. head of the hospital whatever but uh, no that was the woman uh suffered alone yeah well thank you and again as i as i always say that when people read books i i wonder if you can comment you always get all other people writing reviews and isn't it amazing when somebody reads your book the most odd circumstances somebody will say you know in your book in your book it triggered this for me mm -hmm. so here i am talking about my own birth and not being my dad not being allowed in you taught if, through that experience you, through your book this is the first time in my life i've understood that really? and uh, yes. so thank you that's a blessing and that's the joy of memoirs i think i do the same thing when i connect yeah. with someone else yeah. yeah wonderful i'm glad to hear it uh so i want to get into i wrote it down on my paper here about uh a military wife. So back in those, in that era, you really, you played a role that was, I think I read in your book, you know, sometimes you were 10,000 miles apart or there was just big distance and, and, and Bernie uh, eventually went to war, I think. So tell, tell us about what is it being a military wife in that era, the Vietnam era? What, what, what was that like? What, what did that mean? Uh, for me, that meant, I was with family at the military base. Yeah. 
with women uh, together in the group whose husbands all were in the same squadron, the same wing that went over at the same time. I spent uh, two sojourns up, one to visit my in-laws in Chicago during Christmas when he was gone, and uh, then one to my sister's house in New York. And I found I was uh, kind of an anomaly. I People really didn't care about Vietnam in 64, or 65 mm -hmm. and 66. Yeah. Vietnam, it was just starting to, you get the protests and things. Um, and I found that I was kind of at a lost, uh, lost in a way. For instance, mm -hmm. I went to church with my in-laws in Chicago where Bernard had grown up and he was confirmed. They were German immigrants. Um, and so I went with them. I love that church. And the whole sermon was televised and it was against, the minister was talking against the bombing of North Vietnam. The whole wow. was political. Yeah. And I sat there and I felt like I was this tall. Oh, yeah. And, you know, everybody's looking at me and I'm kind of odd. I'm probably the only one who had a, a, a loved one or a relative in Vietnam out of this whole church. And I just felt so displaced. And I thought, yeah. thank goodness I didn't come home or I'll go to Chicago and live that year. I stayed at the base and was with my cohorts and we supported yeah. one another. Uh, wow. It was a different world. At yeah. that point in the war, um, but you know it was it was still coming. It was budding like a tree. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's amazing, and and something that uh, Sarah Jane said earlier, everyone, and you can come back and watch this teaching. Well, I think those letters. So what you did, which is masterful, is you took a collection of letters that Bernie wrote you, and you weave them through the book. It's amazing to me. There is more. There is there is so much life in those letters. And I could feel the emotion. And there, there's some of those letters, I don't remember them all to, to, to tell you, but there were some of them where I was really taken back, yearning to know what was she feeling when she read that letter. Um, here's an example of a letter, by the way. Uh, the weather was so bad, we couldn't see the other end of the runway. Uh, we caught the tanker with a one F4 on each wing and were in solid thunderstorms for half an hour. Then it was clear until Guam. We had to find other tankers and go down to 10,000 feet to do our refueling. It was an experience, but don't worry, we were not at any time unsafe. I guess it was just my baptism as the weather is concerned. <laughs> uh, there's many other letters in there, and you know, I'll, I'll get you to speak about the couple times where you, I think you learned that Bernie's plane went down. There's one really vivid uh, recollection of this story. Is how do you, how do you how do you process that and and then you know how did you care for yourself self care because there are people who do, would turn to drinking or you know the mental health they struggle with worrying I could I couldn't imagine so what tell us about how it felt getting those letters and how you processed all that being so far away I processed that through my faith for one thing. I found a church in town, uh, in Tampa. Um, they had a program for uh, toddlers for my daughter. And we had a, a Bible group for young women. I wasn't in it very long before he came home, but it was very helpful to me. Also meeting with the squadron wives. Death became a part of it. Uh, I had learned that five months before when my mother died at age 53 out of the blue. Mm. So I, and I went to the funeral of, of my neighbor. He was shot down. He was a forward air controller. And I was, this is what it's really like. It's not like Jimmy Stewart on the screen. Yeah. With Jane Wyman at home. Uh, this is the real thing. You walk in there and everybody's a mess. They're all crying and they, and so on. Uh, what happened to the wife next door? Years later, she married another pilot. This was her family, yeah. uh, the military. So I, I learned to go with the flow. And I also learned that wives that came into this situation that weren't sure of themselves and didn't like the military didn't do very well. They, oh. a lot of, some of them went home for the, for the year. They were over there. Yeah. Uh, some got divorced after the war. But you had to go with it. And I just sort of gave into it. And uh, I'd always been... Uh, proud of the my cousins who were in World War II, and I like military history and so on, and the sacrifices, it really impressed me. 
So I was very yeah. proud of Bernard. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I want to just, uh, there's a film, uh, my brain goes on the journey in my head when you're speaking. So I'm just going to start riffing on what you just said. Okay. I'm going to hold this up. Uh, this is a little book that every morning I read a passage of wisdom and, and my wife and I, are, I was baptized Catholic. So we have something in common. Uh, and I think there's a teaching moment in that, Sarah Jane, what you said that some, sometimes when we can't see the reason why, at least this is what I learned through my faith, when we can't understand, we, we have trust in our Lord and we give that worry and that pain to him. And we know that he won't forsake us. Uh, a few years ago, I had a brain injury. I fell in the bathtub and I'm still recovering from that. And there's a t first year in my life where I slipped into serious depression. I, I, I couldn't work. And uh, even today, my eyes, I have vision impairment. They don't work as well as they should. But I remember turning to my faith because in my childhood, I denied my faith. I think I told you my, my dad was a bad alcoholic. My parents divorced when I was young. It really stood out in this book. And I kept reading it and thinking, there's got to be a higher power. What's this superwoman made of? What is it? And here we find the thread of your faith. And I think that's wonderful. And it's a teaching moment to everybody that, you know, sometimes when we can't understand the reason why, we can turn to our faith. I also want to acknowledge you for it. It had to be difficult. Uh, I'm so sorry for Bernie having to endure in you this protesting of a war. I've heard, you know, being Canadian, we love our American uh, partners, but it's it's horrible when somebody does go and pay the ultimate sacrifice. And I want to just mention one thing I read in the book that there was a story you told. I think it was in Bernie's letter where they were they were flying, and you know it's actually like he, he described it as if you were in the plane and they lost both engines and they had to ditch the plane and got picked up. And I I, I had this epiphany. I went, my goodness! Every time he got in a plane and took off, it's like a police officer. You he you wouldn't know if he would come back. That's and right. and you and you you knew that. Uh, but going back to the war, uh, I know there's many American movies being produced about Vietnam. One that stands out in my mind was the one with uh, Meryl Streep. Uh, it was actually called The Post, where the Washington Post published a story about the Vietnam War. And they had actually received uh, somebody inside the government had basically taken hordes and hordes of con documents that were, uh, I think they were sealed. And it revealed that the government, at, at early, as the war was proceeding, the, 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 the president was told that they wouldn't win the war, yet they continued to send people. And I guess I want to say this, that we have to separate the, the stupid decisions of human beings sometimes. That's that, not true. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have to look at what you have, which is a beautifully written book talking about the, 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 the heroism of Bernie, that we get called and, and, and he went. Uh, and did his service. So we're so honored to talk about him. So I want to go back to the wonderful things in the book about, you know, the how your life evolved with a daughter, Lisa. Talk to us about that. It seems like the, some of the pictures in there, everybody, are really heartwarming. They say at an early age when women or children develop, my daughter uh, is 24 now, they need their fathers. And sometimes women can't replace their fathers. So tell us about how you navigated that. This is, again, part of your story heroic story how did how, how do you how what do you, what did you say to your daughter where's daddy or how did you you know raise her without dad at times well we wives got together a lot during uh thanksgiving and easter and different things and lisa had a whole a whole bunch of playmates whose fathers were with bernie <laughs> and and so it was it wasn't that unusual for her uh most of our, our social life was military. So it wasn't like we were going to neighborhood parties where all the daddies were there. All the daddies were 6,000 miles away. And uh, we, we got together. Uh, I don't know, we brought the sunshine to the kids. We tried to, I felt that it uh, brought me closer to my daughter because she was very precocious in her speech. And uh, we talked all the time and we went places together. And I thought later, uh, she's such a wonderful person. I thought, we really got to know each other because if Bernie, <laughs> we might have said, no, go play in the other room. We want to do this. <laughs> but she was my focus. And then when uh, Paul was born, uh, both of them were my focus. And I was fortunate to have wonderful in-laws where I went up two Christmases in a row 
One, he was in Okinawa before. And uh, my father-in-law was a wonderful role model for her. Wonderful yeah. grandpa. We called him Opa. This German. Yeah. Yeah. And my sister's <laughs> husband was terrific. He was a New York cop. Uh, and she, they lived in Jackson Heights. And we did lots of things together. And she had a little, two little cousins there, boy and a girl. So I felt, when I look back now, I felt very fortunate because now that I know all the things that are happening that have happened in the Middle East, when they take the soldiers now and they send them back and forth, back and forth, back and yeah. forth. Yeah. Bernard went, he came home, he spent a year and got out and went with Pan Am. So we didn't have, I don't know how they do it. I've read several books about that um, in preparation in the last five years. Uh, I just, The League of Wives is sitting on my desk. It's a wonderful book. Um, and it's Heath Hardage wrote it. It's all about the women whose husbands were prisoners of war. Yeah. We knew a couple of POWs. What they went through for seven years, sometimes eight years. And just, uh, so therefore I felt very fortunate. And I did have those role models, the, the men role models. But uh, yeah. Well, but thank I, you for sharing. Thank you for sharing all that. Everybody, we just talked about how how a, a, a wife of a war hero, a distant daddy, how how she you you know you raise a a, a daughter, young daughter. What I really like, Sarah Jane, about the tone in your book is it's authentic. I mean, everybody, this is a lady who for fifty two years, you know, cherished her relationship with her husband. She made it work. What I find is that there is a lot of parents because of their own. Uh, challenges in their lives perhaps earlier lives Sarah Jane and I'm talking about my mom and dad here that aren't aware of the power of words when children are young are mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I have a passion for mental health and brain science now they up to the age 15 or so everything they hear they wire into their unconscious brains as truth so my dad my dad was in the military he was a commanding officer in the British forces my dad was Mom and dad were born in Fiji, which was a British colony. My dad flew helicopters. He was in like, he was a good looking man. And mom said he was looking like her little Elvis in a uniform. And he used to ride a little scooter and all the girls were all over him, played rugby. But he turned into this monster when he got in the army, he started drinking heavily. And, uh, you know, my, he would bring the guys home. And I remember one story where my mom told us later in life, cause she always had trouble climbing stairs. My dad, threw her in a fireplace and hurt her and would bring her home, bring 20 guys home and say, cook dinner. My dad's dad was an alcoholic. So later in life, I understood the story. But what my dad found is when he got in the military, it was the pressure of the military way as well. It was that command and control authority. And if you take a man like my dad, who was broken and you put him in that, um, I want to say this to honor my dad because he passed away in 2018 and your book allows me to have this this story so i'm so honored my dad passed from an unexpected heart attack and i guess for 10 years before i was estranged from him because of what happened in early years but everything in the last few years of my life that i've had to rely on to survive in my life because it's been difficult came from the teachings of my father hmm. and my dad was right. you know taught taught us the way the military was so mm -hmm. i think there's many blessings in that i want to hold up this book and show this wonderful picture that i have here so i'm just going to full screen myself for a minute see if we can show this uh there it is that's um the caption on that picture and i'm sure bring back some emotions it's our first night out after vietnam so i want to jump back into the the story you could probably could write a romance novel to follow up on that so that all the wives could experience their own stories of their husbands coming back That's a lot true. of new a lot of new babies got get born because of that uh, story there so here we are so he uh, we the book by the way everybody will tell you all the stories you got to get it and read it and review it but the, the stories of vietnam i found fascinating just learning through the letters he sent about what it was like in the aircraft there was one story which really got my got me emotional, which was when I think it was Jim is yeah, uh, co pilot, co and Jim was sitting behind. So I didn't know this, but in the fighter jets, when they have to eject, the the person at the back has to go first because if the person at the front pilot goes, it blows the seat back, and and could 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 be a problem. And so tell us quickly about that because there was something going on where Jim couldn't quite get it get out of there and. It almost caused tragedy, but then they got out. 
he wrote his memoirs. Uh, Jim later in life developed Parkinson's. So he sat down and wrote his memoirs. And he and Bernie have all, always talked about their survival after being shot yeah. down. Um, and he, he poured his heart out in his memoirs and I used part of it. He said, you could use my descriptions if you wanted. But um, he, he had the D-ring. He, he found the D-ring and he had it in his garage. He said, and he went down three times. Wow. But you pull to eject yourself. But he said that Bernard waited. Now, if Bernard had waited a really long time for Jim and Jim couldn't get out, they both would have died. Um, wow. So he waited for Jim to get out. Yeah. And I realized when, when I read that and, and talked to Bernard and was writing this, um, how important that was in their relationship because they were both <laughs> friends their whole lives we got together a lot. And we went to reunions and things. What does, what makes a man really close to another man? It's yeah. because they've faced death together. You know, all the old uh, Dawn Patrol and all those even World War One movies about pilots. That's true. They, they have that bond. And yeah. for a long, you see on TV, all these uh, men in their nineties who were in World War II. And that's it. It bonds them together. So yeah. I just thought it was wonderful that he wrote about that. And uh, yeah, everybody, thank you for saying that, Sarah Jane. Hold the book up again. We're going to feature that with you holding it up. Just make sure we get the whole book there. I'm going to full screen you. There it is, everybody. We're talking to Sarah Jane Gary, the uh, author of my pilot, and that's Bernie, her late husband on the cover. Thank you. We'll go back to the. Yeah, I want to just mention again, the part about this book that makes it so unique is there's this collection of letters that were exchanged. Uh, going back to that story with Jim, everybody, it's a teaching moment that uh, Sarah taught us about what makes a man, uh, you know, what makes men two men that committed to each other that way. I never thought about that till you brought it up. It's a great point. I, for those of you who don't quite remember what the D-ring and all is. If you remember Top Gun, the, the movie Top Gun, everyone, uh, and Sarah Jane, you might have seen it with Tom Cruise. There was a scene where his uh, goose, which was his 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 other his his co-pilot, where they had to eject, and in the cockpit they showed that D-ring. It's actually a thing you have to reach down and pull it. Mm -hmm. And so, as I read this story, it keeps you on the edge of your seat, everybody. And I won't spoil it, but you got to read it because it goes on and on and on, like it's like hours trying to get that d-ring when it was really seconds and milliseconds yes, that's not, right. <laughs> just just remarkable i had this funny thought that if there's a way for you to get maybe not that one but find a d-ring that's like that and maybe make a piece of jewelry out of it or something <laughs> maybe that could be like something you'd you'd wear uh but um let's go now so back from vietnam and then you mentioned this era of pan am in doing some research before about Panama, I remember watching a, a, a documentary and it was quite an era. I didn't really realize that where the stewardesses were like, it was a big thing to be a stewardess. And so Bernie, uh, help us understand, he flew the jumbo, or I think the jumbo jets, but he got in as a pilot and then he got uh, furloughed a few times. And then there was a bit of a roller coaster ride of uh, his yeah. career, right? Tell us about that. He was with today when, when, COVID happened and they talked about airlines furloughing personnel. Uh, when he got out of the service in 67 and he could have gone with five airlines, they were, the jumbo jets were just being, uh, coming in, uh, they were just being built. Yeah. And they were wanting these pilots, these Air Force trained pilots. So he interviewed with five big airlines and got accepted and he had to choose, he chose Pan Am. Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, they furloughed, they laid him off uh, two years later because of the gas crisis or it was some excuse. Yeah. And then, then they took him back again. Then they laid him off again. Then they took him back. And the last layoff was 10 years. By that time, he had been, uh, he was commander at the Air, Air National Guard search and rescue. But it, it really wreaked havoc on some marriages because yeah. they, they would start a business and then boom, you know, things happen. So uh, consequently, a lot of airline pilots had other jobs and other interests that where they could make money because you just never knew in those days. But uh, he never flew the jumbos. Yeah. But, uh, he did fly international. Um, and then when Pan Am went down, I think it was 96, uh, he went with Delta. They bought the international A300 yeah. series. I was just on a trip recently and was in the A320. And oh. I think he fly the A3, it was the A310. Um, so 
Delta bought all of those crew members and the airplanes when Pan Am folded. So he just went to Delta. Uh, that's right. amazing. Uh, so that's the other, years, you know. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's the other part of the book. There's some neat photos you've put in there, uh, pictures of some of the aircraft. And again, if you're reading it in this era, and there's many young people who will, some of the aircraft back then, many people haven't seen some of the older aircraft in the military. Yeah, all history. <laughs> I, uh, because now we're connected for life through our stories. I'm going to dig up, uh, when my dad died, I did the eulogy and I, I found a whole bunch of uh, pictures from the 60s of the military, the helicopters and transport vehicles. Um, I did a little video and I'm going to, I'd love to send you that video to see how I honored my dad. Yeah, and I, uh, yeah. yeah. And to all those who are watching this or listening to this, and we have an international following on my show and you know, we honor all the servicemen. And we're talking really today about the heroine behind the story of Bernie, the hero, which is Sarah Jane. And so I want to just put another picture up here quickly. <laughs> Made me smile. This one, you know, what a hot, what a hottie, eh? There's a picture of your, uh, I always, I always look at that picture in the book. There was another one in black and white of his handlebar mustache. Yeah. And was it, that wasn't on him when he came home from Vietnam. Was that just something? No, he shaved it off after his uh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, even in the story, you, you, the, one of the passages in the book, I remember reading about his, you've pictured him wearing his red hat. Was there significance about that hat? It stuck out because it was at the Bob Hope show. And there were thousands oh, okay. of Cameron Bay uh, fellas there on a, wow. on a on a big slope. And did he you was, go to? Were you at that show? I need who to look for on the TV. We're all in the red hats over. Oh, right. I see. <laughs> so that's it. That flag. Yeah, I remember growing up watching the Bob Hope show. He did a lot of work, but that was just oh, amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, and another another person I want to honor, and we lost him too early, was Robin Williams, and he did a lot of. Uh, work too overseas with mm -hmm. with the men in the military right so just something else uh so as we move forward in the story we're getting to the last chapter of it which is really your your uh you know Bear, uh, bernie's home and then there unfortunately there he was diagnosed with als uh before you go into that in any way you'd like because we want to honor the story and learn from it uh, i have a good friend who has uh who's married and his wife's son has als and uh not a lot of people know about the the disease itself so maybe you can just fill us in about that was it part of being exposed to things in the war or was it just genetic or do you have any sense of that uh they're trying to <clears throat> figure it out because it's one of the most difficult things to diagnose they found that if you're in the military you have twice uh you're twice as likely to get als than if you aren't Wow. It could be, in my research, it could be living on a base because there's a lot of buried fuel underneath, uh, wow. underneath the ground, which has happened when they discovered all this. Yeah. You're working in a hazardous area. For instance, in the Philippines and other places where we had bases, they use Agent Orange to cut down all the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was like Monsanto, I think, type That's thing. That's horrible. And they had yeah. Agent Orange, Agent Pink, Agent Blue. So they, they didn't realize then but mm -hmm. um but then now that now that they're realizing it they are compensating people because it's very prevalent in military people so they they can't really say because of this it could be that uh, but, so sarah jane just just help for those who don't aren't familiar a als they, another way is, is lou gehrig's disease what exactly happens when you have that well it's amyotropic lateral sclerosis which means it uh has to do with the, the brain stem uh, killing all the nerves. Uh, yeah. Sclerosis, drying them up. So you have no nerves telling your muscles what to do. Mm. Uh, so you lose muscle power, holding yeah. a pencil, holding a pen. Sometimes uh, ALS uh, victims can receive it first, not in the spine like my husband did with, with his legs. You could tell that was the one thing. Oh, I see. Uh, it's with the throat. It ah. can attack the muscles in the throat and you can't swallow. You have to have a feeding tube. Eventually, most you have to have a breathing tube if you live long enough. Um, but it it slowly eats away at your ability. For instance, Bernard loved to work in his den in the basement. He, he, had, he had built a few houses with a friend. He was very good at that. He couldn't walk down the stairs and go down there. Just, you know, he was so disappointed. But that was his yeah. little... Get away. 
Yeah. <laughs> you have to give up. Love. You have to give up with being fast, quick with your spoon and fork. Yeah. I had to buy these things to stick on them uh, so that fattened them up for him. But uh, yeah, and it takes a lot of uh, humility. And um, the big thing with Bernard was admitting it to people. Yes. Every time. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those things that's hard that's because it's, have, you know. yeah, because it's a visible thing too. Once you start to, it's visible, you know. and you have maybe two to five years, wow, of living average. Some live, yeah, go quicker. Some live longer, but uh, so yeah, yeah. it was well, a I went big shock, you know. Yeah, it, so can you just give me a timeline on that? So he came when he was home, uh, say in Pan Am. What age did the diagnosis come? Oh uh, well, seventy two. He was retired. Okay, so you uh, had lots of travel he was or in the Air National Guard. I um, see. And he developed it at 72 and he died at 74. Hmm. And, and he was so diagnosed at 72. I have a feeling that a lot of what, what he thought was his lower back problem. I see. Creeping in of the disease ah. or the syndrome, whatever they call it. But. All right. So now, everybody, another teaching moment. If you start feeling something, and I'm a big proponent of what you said physiology go get checked out we hear all those stories of people who go and they say you're at stage four cancer well what if you had gone when you started feeling something and uh i want to just say something because you just gave me a gift here i think you pushed me just now to do something i've been talking about uh, my show about my my injury at my, my brain injury and i uh i i just want to share this with you not for pity or anything but something you just said is is going to help me uh for the last year and a half, I've been uncontrollably wanting to just vomit and throw up. Mm -hmm. And when I, w I went to an advanced brain clinic, they had to fix my gait. I couldn't walk straight. I had vision impairment, very serious things. What happened was I actually fell in the bathtub. I was doing a ride for cancer for two days. And the first night after 100 miles, I showered and I slipped backwards and I cracked my head on the tub. And they said if I had gone an extra inch, I probably wouldn't be here. And so that's when I refound my faith again and why you, your book is so, uh, the thread, I could feel faith through your book. Um, and I, 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 so I had to go and work at Costco stocking, you know, I, I was, I'm a CEO executive profiled guy and I was stocking for two years, a uh, night shift doing fruits and vegetables. And <laughs> what's happening is whenever I tilt, whenever I tilt my head, I would like, I feel like I got to throw up and I was, it was happening at the brain clinic. They said that one of the common symptoms of post concussion and many people, even uh, uh, military people get concussions is, is that's a common symptom. And they say any quick sudden turns of your head. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been ignoring it and I just wrote it off. Well, you know, as soon as I hang up with you, I'm going to book an appointment and go get, try to get scheduled for an MRI and get everything looked at because it's just not, it's not going away and it's, it's uh, scary. So thanks for teaching. Thanks for teaching us that so many well, things that we, come up. As we said with, with memoirs, you pick up something and you relate to it. And this the, way it's exactly. helping. That blesses me too. <laughs> the, the wisdom. The wis yeah. The wisdom. So I read, I read some things in the book about uh, retirement. So you two had some travel. Do you retirement? Tell us about the time you had together. Some of the joyful things you did before he was diagnosed. Uh, oh, well, we were, I was just writing a piece about that. We were lucky. We had passes on Pan Am and Jim of and his course. wife, we, she was a part-time travel agent. They lived in Florida and we lived in New York. So we would, we went to Africa. We went to uh, Turkey. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, had a friend in Turkey. He took us on a fabulous tour. We went all over Europe, went to Hawaii. Uh, Bernie used to fly down in South America a lot with Pan Am at the beginning. Yeah. And I kind of regret the kids were little, not going down to Argentina with him. He'd come and say, oh, do this, do that. <laughs> well, later when Pan Am was losing money, they they sold all their yeah. uh, island stuff and, and South America. And I was disappointed. But, uh, oh, we were very lucky. And we like to go and do things. And we all had a role as the four of us. And I'm writing yeah. about Greece now. We had a ball. But I was the teacher because I was a teacher. So I would plan out the route where we were going to go and see. We're going to open this cemetery, and, the, and we'd all and and Jim had a, a bit of French, so he was the spokesman. But uh, we had a great time, and I just uh, I wish we'd done more of it. But gee whiz, if you ask me where where I want to go in the world, 
I love New Jersey. I've seen it all. I <laughs> go back to Africa. But my, oh. Bernie, Bernie kept saying this was his thing. No do-overs. Okay. No do-overs. We've done that. <laughs> but I said, but I want to, I want to see this. I want to see the elephants. So, nope. So because the, the world was wide open when you have a Pan Am pass, it was wonderful. And even Delta too was great. That's so fantastic. Really happy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, payback. I want to put a picture up and tell us where this is. Where was that? Oh, this is when, after he was diagnosed, I said, we are going, we've seen the world. Let's go see the West. And he said, okay. <laughs> he didn't have a cane then, but okay. So we took a uh, vacation by rail and we flew to Chicago, spent the night at the Palmer house. Yeah. Uh, we got on a train and rode all the way out to Salt Lake city with a tour of about 25 people. And then we took a bus all through the West. We were on the Snake River. Uh, there was a, a young woman on there who had a prosthetic leg because Bernard yeah. first thought, oh, I'm so slow and everything. I said, forget it. And when he saw that, <laughs> he said, oh, I'm, I'm okay because there were three of them that put him on that pontoon boat. But that's what we did. And we had a great time. We met uh, two gals from England who were over there and Everybody we met on the train was fabulous. And, and they'd say, well, well, why don't you Americans take these train passes like we do? We love it. You don't feel <laughs> like we do. And I thought, you're right. They come over to our country and go cheap on the train and see twice as <laughs> we go to Paris for a week. So, Yeah, that, that's a, thank you for letting me share that picture and tell us a story. I mean, in the, in the book, you talk about that. And I think that's the thing that, again, 52 years of marriage, I'm at 26 and boy, we, we have something to shoot for, but it does, it doesn't, uh, it's not a straight line up. And that was one of the next questions I want to ask you just a uh, marriage. Isn't a straight line up. In fact, even in the Bible, it talks about, you know, you being in service to each other and making it work, uh, what was one of your most difficult times in your marriage? I mean, there had to, there had to be times where, you know, you, 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 you came to challenges where, you know, what, what was one? Well, I, I realized that um, a man's position in life, his job means so much to him. His self-esteem is wrapped up in it. Hmm. Most men. And I kind of discovered that with Bernie because he never thought he could be laid off from Pan Am. What in the heck was he going to do? Uh, he ended up, uh, he taught a little bit, substitute taught, and he got a job as a, a laborer on the Long Island Expressway. He worked for the uh, of union. And he had done that work all of his life up at camp when he was a kid in Chicago, poured cement and done all that. And, but he, but it was, what am I going to do with my life? I'm a pilot. Do I, after I'm furloughed, do I get rid of my Pan Am number? and go with another airline and then get furloughed with them and Pan Am would never have me back. All these decisions. Uh, and so when the Nat, when he, um, a friend told him about the Air National Guard with the tankers at Floyd Bennett Field, he jumped on it. He wanted yeah. to fly again. Yeah. Oh, so that was the wonderful thing that, uh, that was the wonderful thing, the Air National Guard. And they actually, uh, they saved him. They gave him the opportunity when he went back to Pan Am to fly part time because most of the guardsmen do. Yeah. Uh, then he became a commander a nine to five for those 10 years, the last layoff. Uh, and then he went with Delta. But uh, yeah, he was very fortunate that way. But it, it was a difficult time. But I was very surprised that yeah. he was very hard to deal with. Yeah. He did not want to get that me to get him a job. I couldn't get a job at the phone company. And yeah. for a while there, it was very depressing. Sure. Well, what were we going to do? Yeah. A new yeah life. He opened up a new dental school. I was two miles from Stony Brook University. <laughs> and he always told me, he said, you know, I should have been a dentist. I said, why? He said, well, because I have a place on the lake in Wisconsin in my own airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, there's the dental school. You're 31 years old. It's never too late. I'll get a yeah. job. But he wouldn't do it. He loved to yeah. fly. Everybody of course. That. Yeah. Uh, there's a, the, I'd love to research and write a book on the uh, psychology of pilots because, you know, to strap yourself in and especially, you know, you're going to get called to action. It could be your last thing. I also know that it's safer to be a pilot than to drive in a car. So we have to put it in perspective, right? But yes. I also know that the, from my study of brain science, the brain creates dopamine, which is released in anticipation of reward. And many people who do, uh, 
uh, careers like this, it, it's a rush. It's the same as race car drivers. And sometimes you ask yourself, why do you, why do you keep going back, you know, to mm -hmm. the same thing? It's the same, it's the same principle. I think I've read where people who go to prison, they come out and they offend to go back in because yeah. it, 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 it basically becomes your normal, your life. Yes. It's very hard to say a guy who's had autonomy. And sometimes my dad used to say the, the military actually is so structured. They, they make all your decisions for you other than when maybe you're in combat and you have to make them for yourself. And then all of a sudden you get to come back into the real world. Uh, many uh, military people, I've, I have friends who have come back, have uh, PTSD and other issues. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and they just can't find, they, they, in fact, I have a friend, friend who's a coach and they try to coach military people on how to get back into the workforce, into careers. Uh, into things like that. I want to show this picture, which you got me going about the tanker. Just hold on. I'm going to full screen myself. This is from the book. Again, there's a picture. That was a picture of the tanker. You'll find all these pictures in the book that you were talking about how Bernie mm -hmm. went back into that. Uh, so, so sadly, uh, we, you lost him to ALS. And so we want to honor his memory. And the caretaker uh, stress is a big thing too. So you navigated through that. Uh, how are you doing now? I mean, now that, uh, I mean, how many years ago he's been gone? Uh, how are you? How's your life today? Well, I think I know that I'm more blessed than I ever thought I would be. I had trepidations about selling the house and moving. Uh, it was only two hours away, but, and um, my son at the time, he passed away two years ago, but at the time Bernard died, he was on Long Island with his family. They're still there. He's not yeah. there. But, uh, and, uh, and if it weren't for my wonderful writing group that I found in Montclair, I don't know if I ever would have written the book because I'd always been part of, when I was an artist in my painting groups, Yeah, I had writing groups throughout my over 45 years on Long Island. And I found one here in Montclair, New Jersey, the right group who meet at the library and I started writing these personal essays type things, which were really memoirs. And they were encouraging to me. And it sort of kept me going, kept me afloat. It was in an yeah. environment community and I had to get out and I had my own house, but I, I pursued that because I wanted to do it. And uh, so they were very supportive. And that's, that's how I'm doing. I'm doing better than I ever thought I would. And I've met the most wonderful people through the book. Of course you have. And I know, and I want to say that I know every day that goes by, you you, you know, there's that pain that you experience in your heart for yeah. not having him there. And we honor you. You put on your best face when you're on a radio show and even in the book. Uh, but it's just a remarkable story. And one of the things I was, I was wondering is about just very quickly, you're a teacher, you were a teacher. Is that what you said? Yeah, I, your... I went into teaching when I was 42. Okay. I finished my what? degree because <clears throat> we got married. I don't know. I had two years of college. So I finished my degree and went on to get my master's in reading and uh, English and art. So I taught for 23 years and I retired at 65. Good for you. Uh, yeah. English and art. So basically, would that be what, what, what who are your students? Who did you teach? Uh, I, well, seventh grade down to third, off and Fantastic. on. Fantastic. 23 years. Love I it. Also in Riverhead. Yeah. I taught the gifted after school and art in the summer programs. So cool. You know, very. I loved it, and my kids were older, uh, and Bernard was gone a lot, and it gave me a lot of joy because it yeah. was a district with kids that were quite needy in the social area, yeah, and needed like a mentor type teacher. Sure, so it was great. I, and I'm sorry about the loss of your son. I I didn't realize that. He's in the Air uh, National Guard. Yeah. Yeah. Retired. Uh, do you paint yourself? Do you draw or paint, or do you? Well, I was an artist on Long Island. I showed in galleries and painted. A lot. Uh, and I, I did some writing too. Yeah. But um, when I came here, I, uh, my retirement area, I managed an art gallery here. But when I got with this writing group, boy, I took off like a rock. <laughs> yeah. I was going to do a book. So I <clears throat> gave uh, my colleague the job of doing the art gallery. She said, fine. I love art. My granddaughter's husband's an artist. He's a teacher. He's wonderful. But I decided um, I've been there, done that. I hate to say that trite word, but I've been in a gallery. I've sold my work. I've expressed myself in a wonderful way. So now I paint with words. 
I try to get it out on paper. I think it's beautiful. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of you. And uh, your parents, are they still around or I assume? Yeah, my mother died. Uh, oh, yeah. You're early, it's 50 it's suddenly. Yeah. My dad uh, died in, uh, 12 years later. So uh, really? I really never knew them as older. Uh, okay. People. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Where Where do you think you get you got your strength? Because there's an inner strength about you, uh, from your mom or your dad or both. Uh, <clears throat> probably from my mother, more than my dad, most likely. And I'm doing a one uh, a memoir of my dad's parents, uh, in Missouri, and my grandfather's both on both sides. Yeah, both congressmen. They were strong men. They were entrepreneurial, and Going over their letters and their history has told me this. I'm I'm part of that family tree. Maybe that's where I get get it. And the women behind my mother, my grandmother behind my grandfather. Yeah, he was he was a doctor on horseback, and she <laughs> made all the medicine for the saddlebags for, for grandma. You know, so yeah, I think that's what it is. And it's also from my faith. Um, yeah. So. I think I I think there's you probably don't are because you don't have an ego I I know that but you probably can't see this but I'm sure you know it that there's an inner strength that comes out of you I I've talked to and I don't like it but I've talked to women who have uh, are married and their husbands have careers and they and they'll say things like well I'm just a housewife or I'm just the wife and you know what no I mean if you tell your story, but you tell it with the confidence that, no, you, you, you're more than just that. I mean, you basically, you had your career, you were a teacher, uh, you dealt with this marriage for 52 years, the ups and downs. But I think a big part of what I read in some of the letters was, it was almost like Bernie writing letters to you so he could maybe feel you get your, feel your strength. Because there's some times where I felt, I felt where he was reaching out and, and, uh, you know, even your response in the book to some of the things that uh, you were in the letters uh, was just really, uh, it's like I said, I would say to myself, where do you get that kind of resilience? And so I honor you for that. I mean, it's just wonderful. Uh, we're moving to wrap up. So I have one more question for you. And that is, there is a Canadian study. I'll just quote this to you, the Canadian study. And I use it when I teach, I do executive coaching. Then they, it was from 90 year olds and they said, they asked them if, what were your top three regrets at that age? And what came back was number one, I didn't reflect enough. Number two, I, I didn't take enough risk. And number three, I didn't make a big enough contribution or leave a legacy. And so with all the work that you're doing, when, when you leave this world to be with Bernie, what would you like it to look like? Or what, what would you, what do you want your impact to look like? Uh, I want people to know that uh, survival is possible under any circumstances whatsoever. Uh, never give up on yourself and cling to the love that you have and don't put your head full of the whole world and we're all going uh, to die and this war and that war and everything. Concentrate on your marriage. Uh, of course, a lot, a lot of people are married, of course, but for me, it was concentrating on ourselves as as a unit and not me yes i flew off and he let me do all sorts of arty things and teaching and that but basically it was keeping us together and the yeah. strength that we found that, that enabled us kind of doubled our strength through the two of us to uh raise the children and of course my son when he passed away two years ago it's still hard because both his birthday and bernie's are in may and um mm. So I'm really working on that one, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the blessing through the grandchildren. Yeah. And it sounds like a, it sounds like May, May is a celebration month uh, yeah. uh, that, yeah. that we can remember. I, uh, I'm going to honor you with a few words before we wrap up. I do this at the end of all my shows. I do want to say something about, cause my wife has gone through some changes. She's at the end of her career and uh, just some, changes losing both her parents and i said to anna i said you know and my wife's from italy italian and we met in in our careers i said you know what what's that one thing that joy that y you like to do because she was so immersed in children and family because the, the italian way is it's all about the family and dinners every weekend yeah. and she really didn't find that passion until lately she found uh, drawing we had a dog, a little miniature sheet. So I wanted to share this with you. And Shadow, baby Shadow, and she passed away a couple of years ago. Normally she'd be sitting down here at my table as I'm interviewing you. And we we got Shadow when my daughter was born. And so uh, Anna took 
a picture of Shadow and or took a photo of Shadow and she drew it and it looked exactly like it. And she started doing some things with painting. And I said, you've got natural art there. And what I find is, is that when she is in that world doing her joy or passion, Sarah Jane, she, she doesn't feel pain. So yeah. I'm going to challenge I'm going to challenge you. And one thing I, I like to challenge you to do is even if it's uh, your next book, I'd love to see you draw some pick, some images or do something that reflects your stories and and, and put a few in your book. Uh, that could be a wonderful way to express. And, it's not and that just, I haven't thought of it. <laughs> well, yeah. well I, 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 I'm yeah. going to be your encourager yeah. from this end. Or uh, I, I know another author in New York, he did. He, he actually owns an art gallery. Maybe we'll connect sometime with him. But he told me he did, he's, his thing is poetry. But he did poetry. But when he published his book, he had, uh, he drew drawings with his poetry. And they say pictures, uh, I'm not on a tangent here for a reason, but pictures tell a thousand words and I'm a visual learner. Uh, I might have a little bit of what they call that uh, dyslexia because words bounce around on pages. But when I was looking at your book and I saw pictures, the whole the story came alive so anyway that's my challenge to you uh, if you do, if you do even draw me a picture one day i'll, I'll definitely put it on my my uh, platform and I put a painting in the back one of the back pages of the book oh it's good bernie and me at the beach it's just a little ah. uh, oh well, that yes we no, used to go there all the time so oh fantastic well everybody get the book you'll find it here it is here yeah here. Oops. Oh, it's not in color though on that one but uh but that's that's pretty. You've got some talent there, lady. So pretty amazing. All right, I'm going to honor you as we wrap up here with four words. These four words I write. Uh, they're unscripted. I write as I'm uh, interviewing you. The first one is uh, heroin. You are a heroine uh, to many people. And uh, number two is love. There's that 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 comes out of you. I think it's it's in so many ways. Uh, number three is courage. I read a great quote from Churchill in your book about courage. You are courage. And number four is role model. Uh, I, I read one of the reviews somebody wrote about your book, and it said the gift of the 52 years of marriage. And to everybody out there, I want to say this and use this uh, Sarah Jane as a role model as we wrap up the show, that if you think your marriage is tough, if you think you go through challenges, uh, just look at this lady and read her book and like, take her wisdom. My... Uh, one of my children or my wife's uh, boys is going through a divorce and we've been praying that, you know, there could be some wisdom to help them work it out. Sadly, uh, many people, especially in the, the generations we're coming up, the world's different. Everything's difficult. Uh, we forget those old values and you brought it to us in your, your story. So, um, uh, as we, you'll be getting, uh, you'll be getting an award. And this is the last uh, surprise. So you'll be inducted into the Quiet Warrior tribe. We have a challenge coin. Now, I, I mean, you might know about challenge coins being from the, the, the era of war. Uh, I apologize. I have a screensaver that I had to take down, but uh, I'll send you a picture. But challenge coins were created in World War II, and they're coins. They're actually coins, and, they're, and uh, they were carried by soldiers in their pockets to commit to community. So some of the fun they would have with them, Sarah Jane, is if you your buddy showed up and he didn't have his coin, he'd buy drinks. Uh, but this started an epic. So today, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, where my dad was for 22 years, uh, they have their own coin. First responders have their own coin. Governments have their own coin. Teachers, any community. So I, when I created my show, I wanted to bring heroes to the show who could tell their balanced stories. And so the front of my coin is it's handcrafted and painted and minted in the U S the front is a beautiful image of the, the show, uh, the show logo. And the back is actually from out of Joseph Campbell's work on the hero's journey. And it's a, it shows the, the book. journey. That, yeah. yeah. The journey that we take. So you will be receiving one of those uh, from me. There's only less than 40 or five of those a year that go out and they're now carried in 17 countries and so you're now connected by the threads in your stories, and uh, and I'm honored to give to send you that. And I, I you know, I think I'm going to send you two, one for Bernie as well, so oh, you can keep sweet. that. So <laughs> oh, that's very lovely. Thanks. All right, so we'll be sending it out to you. So one more plug on the book. Hold it up there, and then tell us where people can get a hold of you in the book. Okay. Okay. You can right, get this is. book through Amazon. You can order it at Barnes and Noble. Get it on Kobo. Get it on iTunes, 
I think you can order it through Walmart. Uh, yep. It's on the Ingram list. And Fantastic. And places sell that. And it comes in large print, audio, um, ebook. Yeah. And what right. about your, do you have a website? Yes, it's sarahjanegeary.com. Fantastic. So everybody, we'll put that in the show notes. So please get the book. But most importantly, I, I would like you to review it, write a review, post it on Amazon. If you don't that know would, how to do that, yeah. contact the author. And uh, my next purchase is going to be the audio book, because as I said to you, I tend to be more visual. And with my eyes, I, I, I want to listen to that. So did you self narrate that or have somebody do it? I was going, well, I was going to have my granddaughter do it. She's an actress, but she couldn't do it. I decided not to do it, and the gal that did it was is great. I really, oh yeah, I, I love it. Job. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I love that. So I will be getting it May seventh, and then po posting my review online, so it'll be there, so everybody can read it. Uh, I I published my book as I mentioned to you, and I actually hired a voice actor because. Uh, Part of it is uh, there was multiple characters in it, including my dad. So I, I think sometimes uh, everyone, when you get a audiobook, I believe this, it actually brings this book, the paper book, mm -hmm. it brings it to life in a different way. So yes. hey, why not why not get a, a tandem and have them both in your library? So on that note, I'm going to give it to you for the last word. What would you like to leave everybody with? Well, I've often felt if I could give my talent. Uh, to inspire others, it would be a, such a blessing. And, and the fact that I'm, I've told my story and the, the, pers the people that are gonna profit from it are the ALS people who are in this organization and those that they take care of. So uh, my cup is full, what more could I ask? You know, I'm just oh. so blessed. So, yeah, that's that's okay. fantastic. Everybody like Bernie was in service to his country. You see Sarah Jane is in service now to her, her tribe. So uh, come back, everybody, and watch the listen to the podcast when we release it. It'll be released in 17 countries. And the YouTube premiere video, make sure you subscribe to the Tom Dutta YouTube channel. You'll get the notification of that, and it'll be an epic release. And on that note, thank you, Sarah Jane, for being here. And we will... We will always be connected. I uh, love you and love your story. I have the medals now. So this is great. Yeah. <laughs> Much. I That's... enjoyed chatting with you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. So. <laughs>